innovation like CRISPR came from something which came from the curiosity of the researchers and no one could foresee what will be the result of this research. Yeah, exactly. If I just may um, add to this also, the idea of speculative design is not about solving problems. It's about asking questions and asking these questions sometimes is a starting point for for innovation or new way of thinking, uh, and that is the point. <laughs> I also would like to disagree with you. <clears throat> so so I, the vision of treating a disease that is uncurable is a clear mission, and there is not a question about where we would like to go to. But if there is a disease, the cure of the disease, then this is innovation. Emilia envisions a future where we can just um, inhale a little bit of rejuvenation, Yamanaka factors, a bit of CRISPR, and then we feel, uh, well, we're young, we live forever. We don't have to die, we don't have a disease, I guess. Uh, it's just eternal life, right? And I guess we all notice now in the scientific talks that uh, scientists were quite uh, insistent on that this is not so easy. Uh, and it's not realistic, and uh, I wonder, um, is this something where the cultures clash in understanding of each other, or is it, uh, like, is CRISPR really help to, uh, can we achieve the goal of disease-free life with CRISPR? If yes, um, how far are we from this goal? Um, I wonder, maybe the scientists here can, can say that. You're looking at me. I, I don't work on CRISPR itself, so. Um, but I think we are very, very far from this goal, if um, I may say that. I think more reasonable. So let, let's say we want to use CRISPR for, for targeting specific diseases. Now let's not cure all diseases at the same time and aging as well. But let's think about sort of a single disease. I think inherited diseases are probably the first thing where this might actually work. You know, so if there is a, a germline variant, so a variant that you inherit from your parents and it comes up in, 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 in screening in the embryo that, you know, there is a certain risk of developing a certain terrible disease later in your life, then this might be an, a situation where CRISPR could help to correct this before the embryo grows and before things actually start going haywire. I think this is sort of a reasonable first step. Uh, I, I think it's quite quite interesting that, that you say this. I mean, when I ask here the audience, I mean, who has already uh, sequenced her or his uh, genome? I mean, we only had one uh, in the audience, actually. And this would kind of imply that, I mean, we would already do a screening with the newborns and then uh, would may have this information. So also so in, uh, looking at the society, it seems that at least in Germany, we are very far away uh, from having this in practice, right? But theoretically, if if we could, uh, if that would, n if there would be no ethical um, sort of, I mean, if we if we could have this uh, screening of um, of us, of our unborn babies, of everything, and put on file, uh, would would that actually? I mean, do we need CRISPR to actually um, progress towards the? Um, the future, because you were talking about cancer and the evolution of cancer. I mean, the CRISPR is not really a factor there. You cannot use CRISPR to, to do anything there, right? Well, it's not yet, right? I mean, uh, I said the first thing to do would probably be look look at look at inherited variants. You know, disease risk for certain um, developmental disorders or something like that. I think this is where, be it CRISPR or some other form of gene editing. I mean, CRISPR here stands for all sorts of gene editing tools. And in the future, there will be more precise ones and better ones. But let's just say CRISPR. Um, this is where it might help. Now, when we talk about cancer, we're one step further because there it is actually the somatic changes. So what happens in, your, in each and every of your individual cells when you're already fully grown? And then you would have to target a lot of different mutations in a lot of different cells. And not only that, you would have to make sure that you don't target anything else and introduce new mutations by accident, just because the CRISPR process itself is also um, error-prone, called off-target effects. 
so this is sort of the second hurdle. I see this as more as the second step. Now, if we could overcome this too and repair every cell in our in our genome and put it back to sort of a pristine state where it was when we were born, um, well, then the question would be, what about the epigenetics? You know, and then I'm back with Sasha, sort of. But this is only a small part of what makes us, what makes our cells sort of special and, and defines them is, is the DNA when they, there is the, the transcriptome and the epigenome and all these have to be repaired as well. I think, you know, we're just, it's not even the tip of the iceberg, it's more a bacterium on the tip of the iceberg that we're actually looking at at the moment. So, um, and basically, since it's not really realistic, uh, we're just like really glancing at the tip of the iceberg. Um, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. I mean, what are we worried about? Why are we so excited or even afraid of CRISPR? Um, I wonder, maybe, um, Professor Reich, maybe you have a... I don't. Well, people are excited uh, if, they, if they can start thinking uh, about a vision, what could become of well, of the diseases that we are now suffering uh, from in a more distant future. To young people, I, as I understand them, they simply see forward and think, well, it's now very difficult and nobody knows, understands things to, to a, a sufficient degree and all these off targets and let's try and let's go on, but, but in a far, future, maybe next generation even over, uh, then there will be a possibility to repair uh, if something goes wrong uh, in our genome or if the reading of the genome is uh, impaired, uh, epigenetic effects. I think it's something to look into a far future and at the same time understanding that at the moment application uh, to humans is, is not realistic. But what we see with CRISPR is that it works on every living creature, on bacteria, on plants, on animals, and there is already now a lot of rather realistic uh, uh, projects to improve some properties of plants to well to to, to create uh, immunization tools for instance from bacteria or viruses and so on so this is now the real uh, application sphere which promises a lot of more realistic things. If we speak about diseases, in particular complex diseases, then of course we are looking in a f into a far uh, uh, um, a future and in we have science fiction but realistic. That is the contribution of CRISPR Science fiction is no longer something that is just thought out uh, into the blue. It's now, you have now a way, an idea how these things uh, can work and this is what I call more realistic science fiction than those things that just go on in the, in the media, uh, TV uh, series and so on. I mean, maybe with respect to the fears, right? Maybe I may say, from my perspective, there are two sort of types of fears or motivations why one might be against something like this. One is sort of more based on principles or moral and ethical grounds, if you will, where people say, oh, we shouldn't tinker with, 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 with nature, with you know, embryos, with, with plants even, out of principle. You know, we shouldn't do that. There is a fear behind this, um, no one knows what could go wrong, whatever, but there, it's, it's very very based on sort of principles and, and, and moral grounds. And then the other is a more specific type of counter-argument that comes from we don't want designer babies or we don't want to artificially create, you know, superhumans that are super super clever, super healthy, super strong, you know. 
I think these are sort of the two arguments. Um, yeah, maybe leave it at that for now. Well, it's actually interesting because, um, Emilia, um, I was here on Friday of the opening of the of the studio, and there we uh, quite some people had a chance to to look at the artwork uh, in more detail. Uh, we will have the chance now after the the panel discussion. We have still one hour. We can be here, um, but sort of the the pr um, the reaction I saw in most people was more like unnerved at the prospect of eternal life of longevity. Um, I I haven't seen anybody who went like yay, this is exactly what we want to do. So I wonder, was that intended with your artwork? Oh, I was intended to... Yes. Yeah, I was intended to create something between uh, dystopia and utopia, something that um, is rather neutral and the viewer can decide themselves which side they would take or, or what uh, would they think about it. And what I want to add maybe for the previous uh, comments here that my work is um, not about saying, as I said in the end of my talk, that it's not about saying that with this technology, with the Yamanaka factors, we can now uh, rejuvenate humans, or, or even with CRISPR, it's more, um, it's more about talking about these things before we develop these technologies, before we have applications, uh, way before to kind of clear up what kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of uh, futures are desirable? And I think it's very important to talk about that at this point when the technology still does not work. There is off targets, there is problems to, to talk about it. That is it, is this what we want? Is this feasible? Um, and also, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's maybe interesting uh, to hear that I think also in science, I mean, we very often start with some basic research and we just do things for uh, because we are curious to learn something about biology. And CRISPR is uh, a very good example, actually. I mean, this has been a very exotic field of research for many years and no one took really care about these strange bacteria sequences called CRISPR, actually. And uh, so uh, for many years, people who worked on this, uh, including also Emmanuel Charpentier, were not really in the mainstream and were the stars in the field. And it was kind of a niche research. And then for some reason, I mean, something like this, completely unforeseeable, became such a revolutionary approach. And I mean, that can be learned quite nicely in, in reviews from Eric Lander, for example. And uh, so, I mean, it is not the case that, I mean, we start here as a scientist, I mean, that we have a certain mission, yeah, that we want to do it and that we think, I mean, can we do this kind of research? No, it's because we are curious and we want to learn it. And it's also kind of, maybe also kind of a creative process uh, that, that we do have here because, I mean, the first thing in science is that you identify a problem and you ask a question. And then you start to tackle this problem, asking a question, a hypothesis, and then you start with experiments, designing experiments. And sometimes the beauty of science is kind of how elegantly you design these experiments and how you squeeze out new insights. And that is the most fruitful event for a scientist, actually, to get a new insight, something which no one has seen before, and that you can really say, ah, oh, yeah, that's the... Eureka, I meant, yeah? And that's, that's the thing, what, what is kind of our scientific life. So we never start with a mission that we say, oh, this is a problem, and we do it. This is also kind of research which exists. It's a very program-oriented research. But applied, maybe not applied so. research. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it. very applied, <laughs> yes. But this is not where innovation comes from, usually. Innovation like CRISPR came from something which came from the curiosity of the researchers, and no one could foresee what will be the result of this research. Yeah, exactly. If I just may um, add to this also, the idea of speculative design is not about solving problems, it's about asking questions, and asking these questions sometimes is a starting point for, for innovation or new way of thinking, uh, and that is the point. <laughs>
I also would like to disagree with you. <coughs> so so I, the vision of treating a disease that is incurable is a clear mission, and there is not a question about where we would like to go to. But if there is a disease, the cure of the disease, then this is innovation, absolutely. And this cannot be down, down talk to just apply it. It's not. <laughs> well, but um, do you have a question? Yeah. Ah, okay. Um. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's a question and it kind of addresses to, to, to all of you, mostly the, those people who talked uh, tonight. Um, since, in a way, the, the speculative design is, some, is, is, a, is a method of like telling a story and maybe like reformulating something that is already there, but like giving it a different twist to affect the viewers. I mean, you came out here tonight to present your research and in a way you're doing the same, you're also telling stories. I mean, this was, you know, a performance, you, you, you added a few facts, you know, you showed us, uh, showed us a few slides and you kind of formulated something we should do in urgency and so on. So, in the way, if you do it consciously or maybe not so consciously, you also formulate a story. So, here you see the, the, the role of the scientist and public has, I think, shifted in the last 20 years, we might say. I mean, you tell the story of that there is some kind of future, uh, some kind of nature we have to unravel, we have to find truth, and that is innovation. You tell the story of healing, you know, what we should do to get there. Um, you, you as well, and I wanted to ask, it's more a friendly question, are you conscious about these things? Because if you talk in public, it's in a way it is future in the making, you know? So we don't talk about there's a distant future, and maybe we reach like, in 100 years we could do this or that, but your talking in public is some kind of speech act, you know? You embody the future right here in the present. So in the way you're also speculative designers. Uh, yes, I like the parallel. I disagree that science has changed in that manner. I think that thinking in, in a narrative, in a story, which is true, is a fundamental way humans make sense of their environment and think about the world and themselves and others. I think it's deeply ingrained in our brains to tell ourselves stories. We tell stories about our own lives, which is just fragmented memories, isolated pieces of memory, what we connect them to a story. You know, we, we, we give ourselves meaning by creating a narrative and a story. And this is also the way we reason about things, of course. One follows the other, then this, then that. It's a story, it's a timeline. And so, yes, we scientists do that also. Maybe the way we present it in public has changed. I don't know, I wasn't here 200 years ago, so I cannot really judge that. But, um, hmm? Or 12 or 20 years ago, probably, I wouldn't be too sure. But, okay, maybe that has changed. Um, but I think that's also because the the need or the the interest on both sides for interacting more with the public has has uh, has changed and has gone up and i think that's a good thing right you know um the ivory tower is not the what we want i guess you know it's good to have people like you come here and be involved and discuss this with us so yeah well thank you for the question that was <laughs> Um, I would like to just go back a little bit to what Amelia said about we should discuss the implications of technologies such as CRISPR before we actually embark on applying them, right? Before they're actually ready for use. And uh, since we um, already talked about it, that it's really far away. And what actually, what I was also thinking about uh, when hearing your talk, um, you said, well, we don't need CRISPR, we just need to cryopreserve ourselves, um, basically. <laughs> it's also a rejuvenation process. Um, um, in a way, I mean, um, so CRISPR is one breakthrough in, um, in well, might be in medical sciences, right? But we have vaccines, we have targeted drugs, we have all kinds of improved treatments, and our life has become longer over the last uh, you know, century. I mean, we live longer, we live healthier. Uh, or the 40s and new 20, right? The 60s and new 40, uh, and so on. And uh, the eight-year-old from today is not the same as eight-year-old from only 20 years ago, maybe. Um, so I wonder, um, aren't we already on this trajectory to eternal life somehow, without CRISPR, with or without CRISPR? Um, and um, I wonder, 
isn't that like some kind of ethical conundrum we are in in, in there? Um, because if we imagine, uh, I mean, basically, is medical science then ethical in a way? Like if, if we say that uh, eternal life is kind of not desired, it's not, there are all kinds of ethical questions you have there. Um, is medical science then ethical? Or is being human ethical? I don't know. <laughs> there are people who really say that, well, this experimental, uh, uh, natural scientific medicine is not on the right path. There are people who say, well, it's, it, that's too technical, it goes too far, it's everything. This, this uh, idea of progress is something that, that will lead us astray. So uh, clearly uh, this general skepticism about uh, what can come out of, uh, of natural science uh, applied to, to medicine, to the human being uh, as such, is something that goes wrong. And then there are others and maybe they are in the majority, at least here in the room, maybe, uh, who think that is the only way uh, to improve uh, life with all its uh, predicaments, the diseases, uh, all the things that, that uh, torture us. And this is something of a very basic even metaphysical divide among people, among, among society. Those who um, automatically react pro and say, well, that could be good with CRISPR or with a new drug that has been found uh, to be effective in mice, for instance, and will be applied or not. Uh, to human uh, beings, yes, it's something we are enthusiastic about and uh, wish to go forward. And then there are others who automatically look uh, for, don't feel at ease with which is what is going on with us as a big society in future. And those who have this feeling they tend to collect to, to uh, because it's difficult to express it in this uh, simply uh, negative way, they tend to collect uh, and to display the dangers of something. It is dangerous to go dangerous in the sense that it can have not the positive effect that the others are promising, but there will be negative effects and you scientists, med uh, doctors and so on, you are not enough wary of uh, what can, uh, can go wrong. And to my mind, this is simply, uh, if, if we simply discuss, for instance, about um, uh, genetically um, uh, manipulated food, for instance. And there are people who simply are at ease with it. If it is a good new food, uh, then let's take it, let's try it. If something goes wrong, then we can react to this. And the others uh, see at once there are hidden dangers, perhaps. And this is something which you always will have if you are in an open uh, society, people just coming together, you will have these two attitudes toward progress. And uh, I think that it, that you can point out, you can develop your point of view or can listen to the point of view of the other side, but the divide will in my experience, it was there 50 years ago, and it is now there, always is something. And with CRISPR, it's the same thing. People at once begin to apply it uh, in their brains, to apply it to very risky applications. For instance, what is if we go with what is incidentally being done in, in some labs now, if we go with CRISPR right into the 
um, into the early embryo, into the fertilized egg. Isn't this, one says, oh, it's interesting what will come out. We see how it develops and we can manipulate and learn a lot of it. Others say at once that is something inhuman, that is a violation of basic uh, philosophical or religious beliefs. I think we have to leave with these things that people tend uh, to take sides, to take issue. The question from my audience? Oh, I'm sorry, there's one in the back, was before you. <laughs> Hello. I was just curious, maybe it's a question addressing all of you. Do you rather feel that nature of reality is rather deterministic or emergent? Deterministic or what was the second? Emergent. Emergent, okay. Who wants to answer? <laughs> well, I'll give a try. I mean, I mean, as I said in my talk, I mean, um, it is very intriguing, right? I mean, this basic principle of DNA, once we had the helix and we knew about the base pairing, all this, and, uh, and by the way, all these molecular biological principles were developed by many people who were also before active in, in computer science. And so we, we took a lot of terms from computer science also to describe actually this encoding, right? The transcription, the translation, and anything. So, I mean, this can be read quite nicely actually in a book from Lily Kay. And um, so, I mean, all of this is, um, sounds like that there's a lot of determinism. Uh, still, I mean, uh, as a system, while the systems or the living systems are in a way quite stable. And um, you're right, I mean, um, the whole is more than the sum of the single units, let's say. So there is definitely those so-called emergency principles. And that makes it very difficult, actually, to understand also systems. And I mean, there's a lot of mathematical approaches to model the human cell or, or diseases. But still, I mean, um, it's very difficult to predict from a certain basic organizational level what will finally come out uh, as a result. And there's always kind of stages, let's say, of accumulation and what is very important is that there is cooperation principles. So I mean in evolution or to have such complex function as we do have now in our cells, uh, we always learn that there is a selection principle from Darwin, right? But uh, another maybe even more important uh, issue is that we would never have such complex tissues like or organs like our human brain, for example, or us as human beings, or us as social uh, humans, actually, I mean, if there would not be cooperation. So cooperation on a social level is clearly an issue which has many benefits, additional uh, added values, and that's the same on the molecular level. And there is definitely search, certain stages of organization and then there is this kind of transition, and this is very difficult, I mean, to say how a system will develop in the next level of organization where it becomes an independent system and that this may evolve. So, for example, in our cells, we have the mitochondria, and there is the endosymbion theory that, I mean, these, these organs were derived from bacteria, so you see that also in life. Lots of things have been accumulated and set together to create something new. So, I mean, definitely there's emergency. And so what I try to show in, in, in my presentation uh, with, with the fertilized egg is actually there is something inherently in there, and that's so interesting, that there is spatial information in the fertilized egg which somehow predetermines the embryo and finally the, the newborn baby in a way. But I mean, there is lots of tiny uncertainties in there how it will develop. You cannot say from scratch how it will develop. And then there's always kind of yeah, trajectories. And then uh, as said, also with these epigenetic valleys which you may go through, you may always have kind of trajectories which then determine in, in, in the, uh, in one direction and you cannot go back anymore. 
So there is something um, which, which is then done and uh, then it is determined in a way, but then there is new ways how it can further develop. So difficult to say and I think with the new excellence initiative there's also a new cluster working exactly on this. I'm not sure if this was in Heidelberg, I think, but I have to look up. How I feel with this, I feel that this is actually great that, I mean, this is actually life, right? That makes life so interesting compared to a natural substances. That's why I studied biochemistry and not pure chemistry, for example. Did you uh, refer to Lily and Kay? Yes. You know this? Yeah, book, book of Life. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the, with causality, uh, the 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 riddle with uh, causality is that if it becomes multi-causal, it tends to lose its basic sense. Multi-variable uh, systems, in particular, if the uh, the acting the acting. Uh, substances uh, act in a non-linear way tend to lose uh, the de deterministic structure. It's very easy already to be, uh, can be shown in mathematical models or in very simple chemical or biochemical systems. So the question then, if we are speaking here about uh, biology at large, and about uh, then applying it uh, to, to, to human uh, natural life, uh, the idea of, of a uh, metaphysical causality is something that will not lead you very far. Uh, we have the usual problem that uh, the causality can, is being confounded with correlation. What you see in statistical studies, for instance, ab uh, about people, what you can see if you, if you measure blood pressure and look at uh, their style of life, for instance, as a, a uh, and, and think about a causal connection between lifestyle and blood pressure. Uh, if you think about these, you have a multi-variable uh, uh, system with non-linear interactions and each mathematician will uh, confirm that this is no longer a causal system, but a system of strange, rather, a system of strange correlations, where you don't know whether you really have something where you can, can you affect causally or whether you have to go, well, to, to be, uh, to be, uh, uh, to go away with the correlation as a, simple, uh, as a single possible um, uh, knowledge that you can get out of it. Um, one just quick follow-up question uh, to Amelia. When you were at the MDC in our labs, what, what feeling did you get from the scientists? How do they think about biology? Is it deterministic or emergent? I think uh, deterministic was maybe the uh, maybe the major uh, feeling I, I got out of it. But of course, it varies uh, with every scientist sees things differently. But uh, that was my feeling. Okay, so we don't have an answer. It's both. <laughs> uh, we had um, another question from the audience, but if it's not connected, then we can just maybe take this one. Sorry, I have to apologize to ask another question, but this is so intriguing. Um, you, you, you mentioned Lily Allen Kay and uh, you know, the, the history of the invention of genetic code. And um, actually, if we think about the, the question of, uh, of determinism in the way, I mean, in, in the 1950s, you know, biology was like uh, just got in the hands of, of uh, of the informatization, uh, like information theory, and uh, of cybernetics, because it was like so, you know, 
so kind of biology shifted towards techno science and because it became like you know readable machine readable in the way and um, I guess what we have today and Lily LNK shows this in a nice manner she says like you could never imagine the success of like cybernetic biology by not thinking about that after the reading comes the writing you know so we just live on the edge of this part that you know biology becomes an engineering discipline in a way but everything refers back to the idea that there is some kind of like code driven machinery within the cells which is the DNA in a way she calls this the locus of life and my question would be I mean you, you come from informatics um, you also have a very cybernetical approach a very code centered notion of life is it possible to think of a of a biology beyond the genetic code and beyond this image of that there is a molecular machinery that actually makes it possible that life emerges from that that's a good question for Simona, i guess as the <laughs> clinician here sorry i didn't address you <laughs> It's not a good question for me at all. <clears throat> well, yes, there is much more than a genetic code. And, and I just would like to, to comment on your first sentence of your question when you said the, in the 50s the genetic code was invented. It was not invented, it was found. You know, very important. No, yeah. That's the clue with the, who wrote the genetic code. It was yeah. invented as a code. Because you could prescribe it or describe it. Mm. So the, the epistemology of the code was invented. Maybe there is four base pairs, yes, that's true, but to talk about it is an invention. That's the epistemological clue and this process. Okay. I mean, biochemists will call this right uh, specificity, for example, and that, that's what he means. The question from the audience, a different topic? Yeah, I just had the question to the topic before, where um, how far science. Um, yeah. I don't know working, but, um, yeah you, you said that the society is kind of divided um, between those people who say research shouldn't go further and the others say, yeah, let's try. What is your personal meaning? How far should science go or which fields of science shouldn't, shouldn't be researched on further? Also, maybe it's like the question of the boundaries, right? Like, yeah. So what's the, what's the threshold or what's the boundary? I mean, this is this is an old and recurring topic across all of literature as well. Think of the physicists, right? And let's just stick with the general notion that whatever can be done will be done at some point. And the question is not if we do it, the question is how we do it. Can we find the right agreements as a society, the right laws, the right framework, the right the same common moral and ethical grounds on which we want to conduct certain type of experiments? Can we agree on something there? not decide whether we do, shall we do it or not do it because if i mean it sounds always a bit silly but if we don't do it someone else will but even someone within us but you know will do it at some point it's it's un, it's i don't think it's stoppable and do you think the society now is ready for that well the i mean no one's ever ready for change society hates change you know we all see that over and over again i think it's um the degree to which this is being discussed I'm not saying the mode in which this is discussed is good, but the degree to which this is being discussed shows that people are actively partaking in the in the discussion on a you know in the in the pub as much as on the political stage, and I think this is this is good, and everyone should contribute. Um, I think the the course of reasoning could be rationalized a bit, could be rationalized a little bit, and you know, maybe scientists be heard a little bit more. But that's uh, my per maybe my personal opinion. I think yes, the degree to which this is being discussed is good, and it shows that that people are actually, you know, ready at least to talk about it. Emilia, what do you think? Which boundaries should not be crossed? Yeah, I think it's also a very uh, difficult question, or you cannot say this and this <laughs> so black and white that this and this boundaries uh, should or should not be crossed. I think it's just um, the main thing is to discuss about as I just said, like where this might lead and if it's something uh, desirable or undesirable to us. I think you, it's very, you cannot really name a certain topic so black and white that this is, should be done or shouldn't be done. But it's exactly as you said, if uh, 
you know, if it's possible, it's done somewhere, you know. <laughs> so uh, that's, that is exactly why, uh, even if it's not happening here, it happens somewhere else. And I think that's why we should talk about it also here, uh, what, <laughs> what might happen or how this technology might be used. Maybe as a last comment to this, um, the problem really also is that if we decide as a society that we are not partaking in a certain type of research for, not at all, for on, on moral grounds, and someone else on this planet will be, will be doing that research, um, then we are also not in the position later to try to control it. Then the decision, what it is being applied to, be it embryo editing and you know breeding humans, I don't know, that's the typical fears, this is not being decided by us anymore because we don't have the technology, we don't have the, the institutions, we don't have the reputation in the world, the authority to even discuss this if we're not doing the science in the first place. So if we want to be able to control our fate of what is being done with the technology later, we have to partake. We have to take part in it, we have to be a part of it, and we have to bring the society together and have this dialogue together. Okay, uh, we kind of running out of time, crazily. Um, already <laughs> 45 minutes have passed, <laughs> um, but we can still have some more questions from the audience. Maybe there is one over there. Yeah. So this question is about access to the technology. We talked about the fact that we, yeah, we talked about the fact that uh, we wanted to. research should be open to everybody since we mostly use ourselves. We are the data of people and we're using no big data to process them. So should that data be to everyone or should we keep it lots Well, okay, open science question. Uh, actually again Zimona because thinking about patients and uh, all the sequencing <coughs> data comes usually from patients, right? So well, sure. Yeah, here this is this is of course somewhere where I need to have a split personality. As a scientist, of course, it would be great to have access to all the data that are available and and to to um, you know drive conclusions out of that. But as a as a person responsible for for patients, I would need to do everything I can to keep these data protected. And I think it's very important, even you know, if not. All of you have have um, sequenced the own genome yet, um, but still, you know, you would like to know what happens to these data and who will know about it. You know, very important, and I think data protection here is very important. But still, I'm I'm absolutely pro open science. But I think with patient data, you have to look at this very carefully. Let me let me put a question to the audience, to the one in the audience, uh, Jens Hanke. Do you publish? Would you publish your uh, your DNA sequence, or would you keep it for yourself? I can publish. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> My genome. I'm, I'm a bioinformatics guy, and I'm, I have uh, studied a lot of uh, DNA and protein sequences with, uh, with the algorithms, and my DNA is very boring. <laughs> okay, so who would want to read it? Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. If I may, uh, just for one sentence, maybe it's worth also distinguishing between should science be open, and I think we all agree science must be open, which means it must be open to the public, everyone needs to see the results, the algorithms, whatever we use, experiments need to be available. The second question is should data be public? And there again, it's kind of re related to what I said before, that if we're not, in Germany we have very st strict data protection laws, and so you can already see that in terms of data science we're falling behind, let's say, the US and what happens internationally. Now that doesn't mean we should spread the data and uh, remove all data protection laws, but again that this is a case where we need to have a dialogue and we need to make sure that, for example, you could share your genome but maybe not tell everyone that it's yours. 
You know, I know the genomes are not completely anonymous, and there's always ways of backtracking, and you know, it's it's hard to completely anonymize a genome. But you know, we sh should be able to share data with scientists for public research, maybe not with insurance companies for optimizing their profits. You know, so there is again a dialogue that needs to be done, and we need to make sure that we make the right decisions in the right places to let us not fall behind in terms of technology, but on the other hand, also not turn into the U.S. If I may say that. In terms of data protection, I mean, it's a fantastic country, of course. Okay, so there's one more question in the back, and then the last question here, and then I think we have to close here. Uh, so my question is more about epigenetics. Um, so I read some um, studies that recently showed that epigenetic changes happening in the parent uh, or parental cell during the life due to some environmental factors like substance, substance abuse or uh, radiation and so and so um, can affect the offsprings and my question or it would affect the, the offsprings to have a tendency similar to the parent um, and my question is would epigenetics at some point could some point um, become genetic or like I mean could it affect the actual genome <laughs> Who wants to answer? <laughs> so you are right. I mean, uh, this can then influence the next generation. And uh, then it depends a little bit um, on, yeah, actually the further circumstances of, of, of the life of, of the newborns. And I mean, uh, you could start, for example, with, with bad starting conditions. And this could then further continue. So there's, for example, in the nutrigenomics field, uh, lots of studies where it has been shown that babies of, of, of mothers who are overweight, who are slightly or even dia heavily diabetic, that these babies start already with, with a higher weight, for example, also with elevated blood glucose levels, for example. And then you start off already with, with on, on, a, on, a, on a worse level. And I mean, depending on the circumstances, also your behavior is kind of influenced. And now imagine, I mean, you, you have kind of these, I mean, that, that uh, the, 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 the environment somehow imprints, as we say, the genome. And this can be manifested then in a way uh, if this cannot be reprogrammed in a way. And this is kind of very difficult. That's what this, this picture wanted to show with this marble in the valley. Once you are in one of these valleys, to get out of this again is a huge effort. So it kind of predetermines, but it does not completely determine that you stay in this uh, direction. But uh, I mean, it could in principle be reversed. And there's, for example, drug companies who heavily work on molecules which do reverse, for example, um, epigenetic uh, dysregulation. Okay, and last, very last question here in, in front. Um, so I study philosophy of science, and um, when I was studying philosophy of science, one of the questions I've always had is, it's almost impossible for me to go into a lab just because of a departmental difference. I was doing a PhD program in philosophy of science, but I could never go into a lab. And when, usually in the philosophy department, what you end up doing is study a lot of his, historical texts. For instance, when um, Darwin by now about this like tree of life, whatever, and then you study, we study like social Darwinism or like how people discuss and um, some texts that people are actually, they have written about um, what Darwin has discovered. So what we end up doing is something that's very, very historical. But if we actually want to go to a lab, it's almost impossible just within the same university system. And I think that goes back to the question that uh, Amelia was trying to ask is, is there moments, I have friends who are like scientists, you can ask them, but you cannot go to their labs. So is there moments in your research that you actually thought, okay, this might have social implications that 
is beyond what I discover. So it's not just out of curiosity or, or what I find out here, but this might actually have social consequences and change how society will operate from now on. Should there be such moments and how would scientists deal with that? Like, is there such a thing as social responsibilities of scientists, which obviously a lot of philosophers of science would not be completely um, be able to control because we cannot go to labs. Well, I would we think that in daily life, you know, we, we do our work and do not reflect so much every day and every hour what is now the social implications of the specific experiment we are doing. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's in a way also quite, to me, it sounds quite unfruitful. I mean, to, to study again Darwin, right? I mean, this is old stuff. I mean, you really should work in an environment of active research, also as a philosopher, because otherwise it's historical and in a way also quite irrelevant, I would say, to again and again study and compare, compare these old, old, old stories. So, I mean, you are, you are invited to visit us at MDC, no problem. Um, if, if this was a question behind. <laughs> May, may I may I just from a very practical point of view again answer to that. So so when spinal muscular atrophy um, existed and for many, 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 many hundred years, you had to talk to the parents and say, you know, you have a child with spinal muscular atrophy and this child will be dead when in ten months. Period. And you had to, to talk to them about this. And about three years ago this changed and these children now celebrate the first birthday and they walk around and they go to Kita. So I think this changes society, maybe not in the, in the theoretical way you think about it, but it does change society because the entire way you, you have to talk and to, to pers your perspective on, on disease changes when you do the research and we, when you do pursue that. Only from experience I can say that scientists do discuss these things. I mean, if there are new experimental techniques, you know, that might be for real or, you know, just might be abused or have any sort of impact, this is usually discussed. You know, it's not like we always have committees and sit together. It's like, oh, let's think about the social implications. But, you know, it comes up in dialogues in, over coffee and it's something that is in the minds of the scientists. And I haven't seen anyone that just says, oh, I don't care, you know, whatever, for science. And I don't think that's... Uh, how it works. Yes, but it, it does. I mean, as soon as there is a, as soon as, but that's why science must be open. That's why science must be open. You know, if there is a result, and the result has social implications, this result gets published. And it must be published open access in a way that is accessible to everyone. And then the field will pick up, pick up on it. And if it truly has such an impact, immediately it will be in the news, it will be in press releases, people will start talking about it. It will be immediately be turned into a social dialogue, you know, in the community. And I think this is sort of the, and the guy here disagrees, but this is usually how it works. <laughs> no, it was just a comment to mine, like, no, more questions. You were shaking um, your head so yeah. negatively, I thought, oh no. <laughs> we you are you want to comment? Overtime. You want to comment on this, or no? Yeah, 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 with the, with the beer and the pretzel downstairs, or upstairs here at Emilia's. Uh, oh, sorry, okay. okay. <laughs> sorry. No, we really have to, we have to end, because, uh, we, yeah, it's been a long symposium, and we have... We have to end, basically. Uh, but thank you very much for this great last questions because, uh, question because actually, I mean, yeah, that's exactly why we're here, to talk about these things. And I hope this demonstrates as well that scientists are very interested in the dialogue with society and not only our MDC scientists, but also scientists like generally. And uh, so, uh, and often actually um, it's, it's harder to find the interested citizen in a way, you know? <laughs> so if you are interested, talk to us, ask us, call us, come and visit us, and you know, and we are very, very happy to talk to you. So um, this kind of concludes the, um, the symposium today, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for all those interesting questions, and I hope you stay for a bit and continue discussions, and definitely visit the exhibition here and all the other ex um, exhibits here. And uh, well, see you maybe soon at the MDC or in any other event we're organizing and uh, let's keep the dialogue going. So thank you very much. <laughs>